If you had a chance to change one thing in Africa, what would it be? Man, the mentality, you know. I would want people to understand that actually Africa is the life for, you know, everyone in the world. But for some reason, we've, you know, oppressed ourselves. So the way of, thing, the way of looking at things, you know, that would be the first thing that I would change, the way we see things. Our mental uh, way of, uh, of, 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 of reasoning, because we are capable, but we, are not, we don't believe in ourselves. We believe in someone else, you know. Our own ideas, they will always put them last. This is my second day in Burundi, and the first day that I tweeted, hey, I want to meet entrepreneurs in this country, Everybody was telling me, you need to meet Dr. Jackson because he's an inspiration that we all look up to. And I was like, who is this Dr. Johnson? My name is Jackson Nahayo Quincy. I'm uh, 37 years old. I'm a Burundian. Um, I'm a farmer here. Lived in North America uh, for most of my life. That's where I did my education in healthcare. And, um, uh, decided to come back to Burundi to work specifically to build a hospital and to work in healthcare and quickly realized that uh, there was something that was more important agriculture and feeding the population so I decided to go into farming. How many farms, how many different crops are you growing right now? Yes, so the main one like I said is soybeans uh, and uh, maize but we do cassava, we do a lot of things. Uh, we do amaranth for vegetables, we do cabbage, uh, we do uh, even chili, hot peppers, yeah. uh, we do uh, eggplants, we do bananas on a large scale as well, uh, we grow bananas. And then on um, <clears throat> animal husbandry livestock, we do chickens, we do fish, tilapia mostly, and catfish. Uh, best moment in doing what I do has been to see that there is people that are better off, that are, you know, um, better off today because of my existence. Youth that have earned some skills under their belt, people that are sick that have been, you know, treated in some of uh, uh, the health centers that I have built in uh, two of our hospitals, um, the people who have earned themselves employment and they're able to sustain their sel themselves, to support their families, because we created jobs for them. So we do things slowly, and uh, sometimes our friends come in and say, hey, let's assist uh, you know, with the project you're doing. Because whatever I do, I first see if there is any good for the ordinary people. If it's beneficial for ordinary people, then I do it. I don't think about me, I think about others first. Is this need there in that community? Then we talk to the community leaders and then we get to work. How do you feel any time you come in here? Well, really, one thing that I was challenged with was when I was thinking of building this here, people were saying, you know, take it to the capital city, you know. There is nothing here, there is no money here. You won't be able to find people to, to be interested in coming to work here, you know. So, uh, in my heart, I was determined to do it. And I said, you know, it's not all about the money that I need, but I want to be able to respond to a need that is not, uh, you know, that is not there, to something that is needed. If I see there is need for the hospital because I, I would always see people that are sick and they just leave them home. So we started out of nothing to build this place. Uh, where, 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 where do we see Jackson in the next 10 years? Uh, really, uh, I think the question would be, where do we see Jackson's? You know, where would we see Jackson's in the next 10 years? <laughs> Hey. 
my brother, the people of Burundi in the diaspora and at home are telling me that you are an inspiration to them. And I just want to tell you, thank you so much for inspiring your people. Thanks, man. What are you doing that everybody is telling me I need to meet you? Like I said, uh, my name is Jackson Hayo. Um, I prefer just you call me Jackson. I need no titles. I'm a farmer uh, working here in Burundi. Were you born here? Yes, I was born in Burundi. Mm -hmm. Burundi? Correct. You grew up here? No, I didn't grow up here. Unfortunately, I lost the chance to see my childhood here in Burundi. What do you mean? Well, um, there was war. Um, as uh, you may have uh, learned, Burundi has got a uh, lot of history. Uh, of uh, um, civil wars, so I was one of the victims of that. And in 1993, um, uh, when the, the, the democratically elected president was assassinated, I was only six years old and uh, war broke out. And uh, <clears throat> so, you know, there was uh, lots of uh, fighting and me and my sister were trying to run just over the, over the over the river uh, by Congo side, and um, unfortunately she got attacked, um, and uh, she was wounded. Her lungs were punctured, and so what do you we got to she, a place. What do you mean by she was attacked? Uh, she was shot at, uh, gun, 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 gunshots. Um, Where were your parents? Uh, actually, at this point, we had left. We, we thought our parents were dead because uh, the rebels attacked the, uh, uh, the, the, during the war. Uh, the, our home, our, our village was all attacked. So we are sort of like, we escaped pretty much. You watch your sister die. Yeah, when uh, we couldn't walk no more, uh, we went to a place where she told me, you know, I can't walk no more, just uh, run. Otherwise, they're going to they're gonna come and find you. So the, the soldiers at the time, um, <clears throat> the government soldiers at the time, were the ones waiting for the people. They're actually the ones that shot uh, my sister. And uh, uh, she, couldn't, she couldn't make it across. So I left her there to die. And uh, um, I tried to, 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 to run on my own uh, to, to, for survival. Someone gave me a helping hand and helped me cross the highway that you've seen there and um, I, ended, I ended up in the Congo. But life wasn't easy for me in the Congo because, you know, I suffered. I didn't know the language. I was only six years old. I didn't have a family. So I had to, to, to really to, to struggle to survive. I had to hustle. So I had to look after people's uh, goats and cows to be able to get food and eventually I got malaria, too sick that I couldn't, uh, um, I was almost dying, so they took me to uh, a Catholic um, nun's uh, clinic called Sange there, where I went to get treated with malaria. And from there, I was um, reunited with my uncle who was studying in the Congo at the time, so he took me in. I lived with him for two years, and unfortunately, war broke out again. So we started running all over again. broke out in Congo too. Yeah. And what happened to you? This time I didn't want to wait too long, man. I had suffered so long. I didn't want to get shot at like my sister. I didn't want to go through the trouble I had gone through. So I just was the first one to just, you know, to leave that town. Jumped in uh, a ship uh, that was also, you know, fleeing uh, the port there. And I just tried to find my, my, myself a spot to hide. Uh, we ended up in Tanzania. Uh, I knew nobody, my uncle wasn't there with me, and um, so we lived there for a long time, and I remember that um, uh, in the camp called Miovozi where we lived, um, there were other people who were trying to go to, uh, you know, like to, to go to some other places, so we flew, we flew, we, I flew with them. Some of the things that they did, man, things that can't happen to, to a human being, I remember that they put a cast on me pretending they were taking me to the hospital because they didn't have passports, they didn't have papers. So to be able to, uh, to cross countries, they had to put this, uh, 
this cast on me and pretended they were taking me to the hospital. So then uh, <clears throat> we ended up in Mozambique. They were arrested, um, then uh, in, deported into Zambia, and I became a street child uh, for, uh, you know, in Mozambique. Some time in Zambia. In Zambia? Mm -hmm. How did you end up in Canada? So in Zambia, when I became uh, a street kid, I, I was looking, I mean, even as I was a street child, I, I still had uh, Ubuntu in me. I still had, um, you know, uh, kindness. I still also longed to, to be somebody. So I started looking, I mean, I was living with other, you know, like kids that were doing drugs and stuff like that, and my heart never allowed me to do so. So one day, as I was looking for help in town, I um, came across um, a building that said Bible on it and walked into there. First door I went into was a law firm. You know, they saw, you know, this scruffy child coming in, so they, you know, they yelled at me. Uh, I went to the upper level, I knocked, and uh, that time a white woman who's become my adopted mom came out and, uh, and uh, she asked me what I was doing, who I was. I didn't speak English at the time, I didn't know English, but I tried to communicate, you know, the human language, uh, and she understood. So she asked me, she gave me some transport money to go back where I was and asked me to come the next morning when her husband, uh, my adopted dad, will be there. So then I, uh, I, I came the next morning and they said, how could we help you, you know? So I told them I, I wanted to go to school, I was just alone, I didn't have family. Uh, maybe if I went to school, get educated, maybe I could have my own family. So they didn't doubt me. They said, you know, we'll support you for, uh, with school. So we went and found a school and I started uh, uh, grade five in Zambia. I started to learn English, uh, started to learn the culture, the local languages. And uh, I had to be on fire because, uh, you know, I wanted to, it was a chance when I was remembering what happened to me in Congo and stuff like that. This is a chance that I couldn't take for granted. So I started, ex I studied extra hard. I was always working hard. The first term, I think I was the last in class, but the second term I was number two. The third term I was number one. Wow. And uh, yeah, so then I, you know, like, I was on the move, you know, like I, uh, I became, you know, a firmist at the time. You say, oh, the kid that studied, you know, likes to study so hard. I was getting all these awards for being a disciplined child. And that kind of, like it didn't get to me, it didn't make me proud, but it, it made me humble and even encouraged me because I could see a child who doesn't speak English comes in an English speaking country and is dominating, you know, like it was humbling. So it made me want to, work hard and hard and hard. Then eventually we got to, they, they brought me to Canada. Uh, that also was a cultural shock, hmm. you know, cause I, you know, I went to high school there. Uh, it was very cold, minus 30, minus, 30, you know, 25 degrees Celsius. It was very tough, but um, I tried to adjust. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I was working really hard. I was, uh, you know, also I had a big wound in my heart because I was thinking of my sister that I left, um, you know, behind, uh, who uh, I thought she was dead. By the way, she's still alive. She survived. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the next morning after I had left her, Red Cross came across and uh, she wasn't dead yet. And uh, they, uh, they drained her lungs. They took her into town in Bujumbura the hospital she was there for more than six months and uh, she recovered and she's back in the village so yeah yeah you but I in, didn't know that at the time when I was in Canada you didn't know how long did you live in Canada um, maybe a couple of deca decades uh, yeah so when I was in Canada it was only in so I, I left my sister in 93 um, in 2005 when I was just graduating from high school in Canada. This is what, when one of my crazy friend, Eric, he's in Canada right now from Bujumbura. He kept, you know, cause you know, really to be honest, I really didn't like to be called a Burundian with all the, mm. the, the bad things that had happened to me. Mm. 
I didn't want to be called to be referred to as an African. I was so sad. I was hurt. But um, this friend of mine, Eric, decided to take a tour, just like you're doing. Yeah. Came here in Burundi and was going around with my adult picture. Show, well, I wasn't an adult. I was uh, only 17 years old. Mm. But, you know, he brought a picture of a 17-year-old in Burundi asking, would anyone know this guy? You know, no one could know me, but when he was uh, stating my parents, because I knew my sister's names and my dad's name and my mom. So he was asking and then he found them. Wow. They were shocked. They had another, they had replaced me over time. They had another Jackson. We are two Jacksons in okay. my family. Yeah, it's crazy. So, and... Uh, so it means your mom and dad were not dead? No, they didn't die. They survived. You know, and this is what, uh, you know, like when you see me going, some people say, what gives that guy so much courage about life? Why? What makes him so hopeful even when things are miserable? I said, man, I've been hit, you know, I've seen it all. I've suffered enough, but at the end of the tunnel, there's always a light. I believe that. So I always believe in positive pos possibilities, even when things are tough. But it's not that it's something I just create in my brain. I have experienced it before. So when I learned that actually when the soldiers came, went to burn my parents' house, they didn't kill them, and that my sister also survived, because I remember when she was, you know, like she was wounded in four places, you know, back and forth. And when she would try to talk, I could just see, you know, like air coming out of her chest, and she couldn't. She was so tired, she couldn't talk, she was bleeding. But so in... 2005, Eric found her and he said, you know, he always says you were, you know, like you were attacked when you're together. Show me the wounds. And she was able to show him the wounds. And so then she said, you know, show me Jackson. <laughs> he says, well, he's in Canada. Well, can we go to Canada and see him? He says, well, it's just not that easy, you know. And at that time, 2005, mobile phones weren't as common so yeah. I think he managed to find a place to climb on a tree that's what he said called my Canadian parent and said you know what we found Jackson's parents and family we were wow. all shocked my Canadian parents were shocked I couldn't talk I was just in a shock um, but very quickly uh, um, <clears throat> as I was graduating we organized a trip for me to come back and see my family. And uh, I was still hurt. I had this wound. I told you earlier that I didn't have so much love for, you know, being a Burundian. So when I got here, you know, I could feel the wound, the wound in my heart to start starting to heal. You know, it was healing. It was healing. And um, I saw my sister, you know, she had forgiven the people that had you know, this is where I had to learn, you know, like to forgive in, even when things are tough. She had already uh, forgiven uh, the people that, uh, that uh, um, hurt her. I saw my family, my parents. I had about um, seven other siblings born after I was gone. Mm. Uh, I saw another uh, small Jackson as my replacement. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, but with all that, I also saw... A vulnerable community a suffering community all my mm. friends when I left here was I think in grade in third grade mm. um, and some people that were in that grade with me they were that's all the education that they had and um, you know there was no running water there was no um, uh, schools no hospitals at that time Burundi was just studying to to come out of war so it was sad um, so I told you I had just graduated uh, from high school at that time I had uh, <clears throat> my plans to go uh, to study to be a, a pilot um, I had uh, a lot of bursaries so when I went back to Canada and I started taking my uh, pre-university courses um, I suffered I you know I had depression I really couldn't uh, couldn't uh, keep up my question was I already have high school and there are some of my brothers and sisters back in Africa. 
that only have that third grade and they don't have food to eat. So it was sad for me mm. and I couldn't concentrate in school. So I had to take time off, you know, and I asked some of my friends, I said, what's the hardest paying, well, the, the hardest job, but the, the biggest paying job I can do as a, as a laborer here in Canada to earn so much money. So one of my friends, uh, Josiah said, you know, one of the toughest jobs is tree planting, but you can um, get a lot of money doing tree planting if you can. So I started doing tree planting and uh, people would say, you know, why are you on fire? Why are you working like you are a madman? What's going wow. on? I said, you know, I have to do it for my people. I started to love being a Burundian, being an African. So I was saving this money, sending it the money. We started with an orphanage. So we built an orphanage. Uh, I, didn't, I don't always like to call it an orphanage. Yes. I called it a youth center, really, because I grew up as an orphanage and I knew how painful it was. So we built the, uh, uh, the orphanage, started with about 52 children, um, giving them education, food, and you know, so I was only doing it alone, tree planting there. And then my friend said, you know, uh, we see mm. you're doing this for almost a year mm. and you also have passion to go to school. Yeah. Why uh, can't you allow us to help, to support you so you can also get your education um, as you wish? So we agreed on that and uh, I got friends supporting me. So the orphanage was getting, was going well. I went to my grad, my undergraduate um, uh, part of, of, of school, uh, did nursing, completed that. And uh, <clears throat> I moved here to Burundi checking and I, I was going back. Um, uh, during that time, I also was working on oil rigs, you know, in the summertime try to drill oil to make money so I can send it back home wow. and um, yeah did uh, some courses I wanted to learn uh, so then I went uh, further with uh, with schooling I wanted to learn about tropical medicine so with all that I was thinking what do I really want to do how can I make myself necessary for my African people Wow. So, you know, my Canadian parents were like, you need to take it easy. You know, you're spreading yourself too thin. They were feeling sorry for me. But I, you know, like I said, you know, <laughs> I only have so much life left in me. I want to try and make myself necessary to others. I want to help Africa uh, be uh, what it is supposed to be because it has so much potential and that potential has been, you know, oppressed suppressed. for set suppressed for certain reasons that mm. we can mitigate or uh, issues that we can solve so uh, <clears throat> 2013 I decided to pack my bags to come back to Africa um, so I managed to 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 talk to some people hospitals um, organization in Canada I said look you have equip medical equipment that you don't need and there's some, some of my people that may need it. And so I was able to collect some of uh, uh, that equipment. I moved here. I said, I really want the place where my sister almost died. Because that image has been stuck with me. I would like to turn that image into a place where we could save, uh, we could save life. So the objective was to try and see that place, that exact place where my sister was left to die. And so when I found that place, I begged the owners of that land. It was just an abandoned land. I said, you know, I remember this place. Well, they had to help me because I, you know, when, where the, 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 what do you call it? The, uh, I knew where the, the armored car yeah. that shot was shooting at us where it was parked so i said this is the place so we tried to locate the place my sister had a very sharp memory she was still here so she said this is where you left me so we looked for the owner of the land i begged him i said can i buy this land from from you he was very nice and he let me buy the land 
and uh, we, bought, uh, we built Ubuntu Clinic. Now you may ask why Ubuntu? Why Ubuntu? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Another long story. Another. <laughs> <laughs> But you built a hospital for your community. Correct. Which means there was no hospital in here. There wasn't uh, a hospital uh, in that area. We have uh, only district hospital is uh, um, Chibitoki Hospital. Are you a doctor in the hospital too? I am not working there at the hospital. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I told you I, 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 I love farming. I decided to be a farmer. Sitting um, at the hospital when we have so many uh, nurses and doctors that could uh, do the work and my mind is you know like trying I'm a visionary looking for things that I could do uh, <clears throat> so I decided to hire people you know earlier you said entrepreneurs yeah. um, you know I have a brain of an entrepreneur a guy who just want to make things work so I'm not a task oriented kind of guy mm. I'm an innovator wow. that's what I like to call myself wow. so I, I had to weigh, you know, uh, the, 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 the options that are there. Are there people that I can hire to work in the hospital or can I, uh, uh, do I have to work there myself? So we trained people, uh, we hired people. We have uh, about uh, uh, seven doctors working full time, uh, two specialists that come in twice a week, 53 nurses, and those are enough. So. I earlier was telling you one thing that I looked at was and I, I don't I haven't always believed in you know in, in, in chemicals in, in you know like having to, to treat people uh, scientifically is good mm. but when you can prevent that so people don't have to be uh, filled with uh, medication and stuff it's a better way so I was here busy looking at what is making people sick? So we realized that nutrition, lack of nutrition, was uh, uh, a big problem. And um, also, I was thinking about, you know, moving Burundi up, moving Africa up. So we needed to empower people. So I thought, what are some of the things that don't, don't require so much of professionalism, so much of legal uh, you know, uh, permits that we could do, but we could develop Burundi, we can create jobs. Mm. And farming was the only thing that you know, I would call is still a virgin here in Burundi. Yeah. And a lot of people know how to farm here, so I wasn't bringing rocket science here. So we started to think together with the community. I wasn't bringing new ideas. We sat together with the community and we say, okay, what could we do to be able to produce much food? So people had a lot of ideas. Hmm. What are some of the, the crops can we grow to be able to make proteins? So I became uh, very passionate about soybeans, which is our main uh, uh, the crop that we grow wow. because of the protein content. Wow. Uh, people were initially growing cassava, yeah. but uh, I also said, what if, because I lived in Zambia and we were using uh, maize uh, fufu, yeah. and I said, what if we start growing maize yes. on a big uh, scale? So that's, those are our main uh, crop that we're growing, soybeans and, uh, and, uh, and maize. And with that soybeans, we process it uh, with the maize and uh, other things like uh, uh, like barley or other things that we, we, we get from outside, uh, vitamins and stuff, powdered milk and mm. that, we make porridge to be able to give to our patients uh, that are in the hospital. But we went further, more than that, we do also 600, uh, 600 children uh, in our community here and 250 children up in my home village there. Uh, we feed them with porridge every day. The result has been phenomenal. First, the number of admitted uh, children, those who had anemia, 
related to malaria, if we were feeding them, the number of the, the children getting admitted just dropped. Wow. And also the healing process, when they have enough uh, food in their stomach, then they heal faster. You know, you can imagine taking medication on an empty stomach. Most of them would throw it up. So it was just like, boom, you know, we're finding solutions. But that was just an intervention, really. We also want people, our president, His Excellency of Burundi, he has a saying that each mouth should have food to eat and each pocket should have cash. So I had to walk under his footsteps. How could we achieve that objective that His Excellency, the President of Burundi, believes in? How could we have each mouth have food to eat and each pocket with money? So we said, okay, the intervention uh, process is over. Let's now start to think about growing abundant food, some that we could give to more people, some that we could trade with other things so that we have a, a health Burundi. And that's what we're doing right now. How many farms, how many different crops are you growing right now? Yes, so the main one, like I said, is soybeans uh, and uh, maize, but we do cassava. We do a lot of things. By the way, this is a conflict that I had when, you know, I grew up in Canada, where we would have, you know, 100 hectares of wheat, just one, mm. or canola. Mm. But here in Burundi, we have that privilege to do variety. So we do beans, uh, we do amaranth for vegetables, we do cabbage, uh, we do uh, even chili, hot peppers. Yeah. Uh, we do uh, eggplants. We do bananas on a large scale as well. Uh, we grow bananas. And then on um, <clears throat> animal husbandry livestock, we do chickens, we do fish, tilapia mostly, and catfish. Uh, and this is, you remind my parents would, uh, and my Canadian friends would say, ah, man, you are, you are, you're spreading yourself too thin. So I would say, come to Burundi, then you'll see that, you know, I'm not alone. I have people. Burundi has so many people. We have, uh, you know, the, the, the human capacity. That's an advantage that other places don't have. I remember in a Canadian hospital, I'll be there on a ward, you know, looking after so many patients. Hmm. Because there's lack of human power. Or when I was working on oil rigs, maybe just three guys operating a rig that would need at least 100 people. But that's the problem that they had there. And I said, why don't we use, the, here in Burundi, here in Africa, we have so many people that we can put to work. And that's what we've been doing. So when uh, my Canadian friends say, you know, you're doing too much. So when they come, many people have been coming now, mm. which is a great thing. They say, oh, now we understand, you know. Wow.